Hello, everyone, and thank you for listening to the Fabrication Friday podcast. I'm your host, Joe Fairley, certified prosthetist, 3D printing enthusiast, and owner of Ascent Fabrication. Fabrication Friday is an all-around fun time where I talk about 3D printing applications, conduct interviews with industry leaders, and much more. Come join us every Friday for an informational discussion around the evolution of the additive manufacturing field and how we utilize various digital workflows and 3D printing methods in our daily work at Ascent Fabrication. Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening to the Fabrication Friday podcast. Uh, this week, I've got an awesome special guest here, Josha from Lictra. Uh, Lictra is a uh, German 3D printing manufacturer uh, company, and uh, we've been in contact now for a couple months, um, you know, looking at the capabilities of their new printer, uh, the FX7. And uh, it's going to be pretty interesting to hear about some of these details from Josha about their technology. So, Josha, thanks for coming on. Good morning, Joe. Uh, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Um, yeah, um, we met uh, a bunch of months ago and we uh, introduced you to our technology. Um, now we're at a stage, Lifa is, uh, is four years old, the company is four years old, so we co founded it. Founded it in 2019 um, came up with our first uh, product on the market. Uh, it was launched uh, last year um, in November. Uh, the printer, um, the FX7 Pro. Um, we're going to get into the details of the machine um, later on. Uh, yeah, Joe, thank you very much. Happy to be here. Yeah, definitely. So the um, the FX7 Pro. Um, you know how did how did this first venture uh, into Lictra start? And was it was it was it specifically in mind with this printer, or was there something kind of in your um, you know last couple developments here um, in your career that led to you being involved with Lictra? Uh, my first connection to printing was uh, back when I was a research, research assistant at university. So we were uh, using material extrusion. Um, it was a great tool for us. Uh, we could we used it. For prototypes um, and for experimental setups, jigs and fixtures, um, and we were happy to have an opportunity to to produce in house um, in the shop floor, lab space, or even in the office. Uh, so we liked that part of it, uh, but we found some downsides there. Um, we were back then printing uh, quite huge parts, uh, molds. Uh, our research went into um, aerospace structures, uh, their design and, and production. And uh, for the experimentation, we would print molds, and these molds would, uh, to be honest, print forever. Um, it took us days uh, to finish to finish molds. Mm -hmm. And uh, using printing in these development iterations, uh, you have to take into account that you go through multiple iterations, and each iteration takes two days of printing just uh, just just to get the tool to move on. Right. And, we thought it would be a great help for us and for a lot of other users of, of material extrusion uh, to get faster processes, um, higher productivity and printing. That's that's what we wanted to do. Uh, we made up uh, the idea of building multi-nozzle printers. Uh, so regular printers use a single nozzle. And uh, we came up with a printer that uses multiple nozzles. They're all in one printhead. Um, and uh, we could push productivity by using the extrusion of, of all of these nozzles. So it's an array of nozzles and all of them contribute to productivity. And you can see that productivity multiplies by, by having multiple nozzles. Um, yeah, that was the basic idea. Um, we planned the development and uh, we uh, founded the company to execute the plan. Um, we um, put a lot of effort in the development. It actually turned out to be a very sophisticated, uh, very sophisticated uh, problem to, on the hardware side, also on the software side. Uh, but eventually, uh, we got everything together and introduced the product. Right. Yeah. Trying to um, coordinate uh, a few different nozzles within one nozzle itself, I'm sure, is uh, quite the feat. 
uh, it's it's pretty neat, you know, seeing this uh, picture here right behind you of the uh, the different colors coming out of this one nozzle, just to showcase like that, uh, you know, the level of how much material is coming, at, you know, being extruded at once. That's that's pretty interesting. You know, that's um, I've been in, uh, involved with more high flow type machines where our nozzle, our one nozzle just gets bigger, right? Um, but this is a super interesting approach to, you know, to 3D printing in a, in a faster capacity like that, for sure. Um, you know, so what, when you talk about the higher productivity, right, um, I guess, first off, how many nozzles are inside that one nozzle? And then what are some of the, um, you know, basis for how you can cut down those hours to finish um, a same size print? So um, first of all, we went through all the measures you have available to increase productivity. And you named one of them, uh, that is printing with larger nozzles. Um, mm -hmm. And this always is a compromise of productivity and precision, right? If you go with larger nozzles, uh, you're faster, but you're not as detailed as you might want to be. So usually the, um, the user, um, they, they look at, their models look at their print job and they decide which nozzle size is the right fit for them. Um, so we, we didn't want to go for the compromise with larger nozzles. Um, we wanted to get a multiplier and productivity by multiple nozzles. And um, so we built the print head. Um, this one that we're offering now, it has seven nozzles. It is um, they aligned in an array. I'd like to show some more pictures, Joe. Could you? Sure. Uh, yeah, absolutely. We uh, we do like the show and tell here, and uh, you know this video is posted to YouTube, and you know definitely if you're listening to this through uh, RSS or Spotify, come check out the YouTube feed and see some of these cool pictures of the uh, the the printer you know in action here and the different colors in the nozzle. Yeah, having having that level of you know detail, uh, where um, you know with uh, with printing with a two point five millimeter nozzle, on the uh, the the Kratos here, the Film Innovations Kratos, um, you know print times go down obviously, but yeah, we're we're printing in vase mode, right? Um, you know maybe losing a little bit of detail there with that two and a half millimeter nozzle that's essentially over extruding to four or even five millimeters in some cases, so. Um, you know, that's definitely, uh, definitely a, a benefit of having those smaller nozzle sizes for sure. What, uh, yeah, once I try to figure out the uh, screen sharing things here, um, can you tell me what different, you know, nozzle sizes go into your seven nozzles in there? Um, so the design, um, it goes for seven nozzles of the same size, um, but we offer um, different sizes there. Um, that means also different layouts, different distances in between nozzles. Um, and just to get an idea, if you use 0.4 nozzle, um, all the seven nozzles, they're going to be tightly packed in uh, within just a few millimeters. Um, so distance between nozzles is below two millimeters if you go for 0 0.4. So we have a, a super tight package of nozzles on the outlet side. Um, and if you go from 0 0.6 millimeter nozzles, it's going to be a little wider, but still, still pretty tight. Pretty uh, tight. So from 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, that's kind of been your, your sweet spot there? Um, it turns out that um, most, of the, most of the users, um, they approach the job, as I, as I explained, um, they look at the SDL. They look at uh, the nozzles available and then they decide which level of detail they want to have in the printed part. And that's how they go for, for nozzles. So we pick them up there and um, allow them to not go for bigger nozzles to be faster, but have our print head with a multitude of nozzles of that size. Okay. Um, so um, we offer 0 0.4, um, 0 0.6, and 0 0.8. Um, and that's a good. Uh, a, a sweet spot to operate. If you go even larger, you um, you might uh, want to think about uh, pellet-based printing. Um, but for filament-based machines, this is a um, this is a good way uh, to go. Zero point four, you don't need to go um, smaller, and zero point eight is the the upper limit that 
that uh, that makes sense uh, to us. Um, it's super tightly packed. I mentioned that. Um, we have just a few millimeters of space where all of these outlets are arranged, and um, each nozzle comes with its own flow channel behind it, its own feeding motor, and its own filament that feeds the nozzle that is fed to the nozzle. And um, so this is on the design design side, on the hardware side, it's uh, quite a tricky a tricky um, problem that, uh, that needs a tricky solution to pack everything together that uh, tightly. And um, once it's done, you can imagine everything to function like seven print heads, um, seven extrusion systems. You can you can address them separately, or you can use just one other, or you could use all seven at the same time. Um, every every channel has its own feeding motor, and each uh, channel can be addressed individually, um, and they can be used simultaneously. So we can adjust feed rates uh, separately for all channels. And this is um, actually how we how we can exploit the potential of uh, of that hardware to address um, to address nozzles separately. Um, we went into a lot of research in the beginning um, of, of uh, the company's life, and we found that if we want to cut down process time significantly, um, we would need to find a solution to save time printing contours, the outline of a slice, uh, because this is where most of the process time goes to. Uh, a lot of time is spent printing printing walls, uh, printing the, the single lines of a wall. So this is the crucial part. Um, we have to tackle this to, uh, to be fast. And uh, we found a way that works pretty well. Um, that is. It's a nice combination of having a simple hardware that does not need to turn the printer is, is not going to spin around in the in the build space. Right. It's just right. travel. You have all the nozzles together. You can imagine uh, for all those in the audience that uh, that don't don't have video available. Imagine you have a, a a bundle of pens that you hold in your hand. Seven pens in your hand, and you have them in your fist. And you move them uh, move them across the table and. Now the software can decide which which pen should draw a line and how thick that line should be. And our software um, it adjusts uh, the extrusion rates and, and activates the nozzles in the just the right situation. We have a nozzle that prints the outer line, uh, so you get high quality surface on the outside uh, with a continuous line. And the other nozzles they are activated when they're in the right position to build the second, third, and also the fourth line. Of a contour. So um, we build up to four lines in one run, uh, whereas single nozzle printing would uh, need to do four runs to do the same. We have a, a surplus of productivity of 300% there. Uh, one run, uh, we extrude as much material as, um, as single nozzle printers do in four runs. Um, and this is the crucial part. If you cannot if you cannot deliver on contour printing, um, you're going to have a very hard time saving saving uh, saving process time significantly. Bottom line for the whole part. So this is the crucial part. But uh, there's print mods that are even more uh, more advantageous uh, if you look at multi nozzle printing. If you have seven nozzles and you um, activate all of them uh, to fill contours, to build uh, solid layers uh, of full, fully filled with material. You can use all seven nozzles of the array. Um, so that's a plus of 600% of productivity. One run, seven lines for us. Uh, the reference single nozzle process, obviously, it does only one, uh, one line and one run. Sure. And then for sparse structures, uh, you, you want to build sparse structures for infill uh, density of 30% at some point, somewhere. Um, a lot of people like to go. Or for support structures, you don't want to print it. Uh, Solid. You want to have uh, want to have sparse structures built up, and we can also deliver in that mode uh, by uh, by using those nozzles that are uh, on the opposite sides of the array. Um, so we can print two lines when a single nozzle printhead has to has to print one, and then uh, and then go for a second round to print the other. Yeah, that's super interesting. So you know, with all those. Um, you know, we can see the different colors here for the seven different nozzles within the whole, um, you know, hot end system here. 
So my first thought is, okay, I've seen some of your prints that, you know, you've done multi-color printing, right? Um, you know, and then the the next question with that would be, you know, multi-color, could we just do multi-material then? And kind of what applications would that have and what applications have you seen, you know, that are already being applied to? Um, it's a, uh, a stream in our development that we follow multiple materials. Um, I have a, an example here. Um, so I explain how control printing works with multiple nozzles. We have one nozzle that does all the outer uh, lines and it may continuous, prints continuous lines. And the other nozzles, they are activated when they're in the right position to print the inner walls, uh, second, third, and fourth um, wall. Um, so what we started experimenting with is um, having the nozzle for the outer wall um, equipped with one material, and all the other nozzles that print the inside of the part are equipped with a um, with a second material, a different material. Hmm. Um, and that we think is particularly interesting for all those that need a certain material on the outside. Uh, it could be for people in the, in, in the medtech uh, space. They might want to have material on the outside that is certified for uh, for skin contact. Sure. Uh, and on the inside, you might uh, prefer something different. Um, so getting certification for a reinforced material, for example, um, is quite complicated and it's not going to be certified for every use. Um, virgin material um, can be certified. So um, a split that we uh, suggest here is to have um, virgin fresh material, certified material on the outside of your part and uh, get reinforced material or recycled material, uh, just to name another option, um, on the inside. Um, so the outside is going to be built purely up, uh, from, from material A, that is um, what you need on the outside, what you need to, to to meet your surface requirements, and the inside is going to be of something different. It could be extended strength you're going for. Uh, it could be um, lower material cost um, you're aiming for. Um, it's 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 full of opportunities to to equip the machine with different materials. Yeah, that's that's really neat here. So we see a, a picture here of a you know kind of outer blue structure and an inner. Um, infill structure out of another material um, you know with the I hadn't thought of that you know kind of recycled material on the inside virgin material on the outside and or you know that skin contact aspect to it that's pretty interesting too um, maybe yeah I'm trying to bring the cost down of the part to um, you know maybe have a, a mix of a cheaper material uh, inside in some places that might not be as structurally necessary or you know maybe then reinforcing some areas uh with a you know fiber reinforcement such as um if you have a high pressure contact point of a hole in in some type of part right and you kind of concentrically outline that hole specifically with a carbon fiber you know um blend filament or the way that uh, you know Mark Forge is kind of going after it with the nylon and carbon fiber continuous reinforcement, you know you could reduce the cost of the part overall by just focusing in on that one area, right? And then you know the rest of the part might be printed with something different. That's that's pretty cool to consider. And if you look at um, the split of materials that I suggested, uh, outside and inside, um, you're gonna have um, you're gonna have all the advantages of both and other printing in terms of productivity um, as well. Um, so the print is not going to be unique in functionality, but also in productivity, it's going to be boosted. Um, so this, I think, makes it uh, particularly interesting. And uh, one thing you mentioned, I can totally agree to an interesting split of materials would be to have a soft material in one spot and uh, a stiffer and harder, stronger material on the inside. Um, this is something that we uh, think a lot of people in, in medtech would be super happy to to have. Um, so that's um, that's one of the one of the development directions that we go to in multi nodal printing. Yeah. Certainly, yeah. I mean, just having those areas of uh, 
again, in the prosthetics and orthotics industry, we're looking at cushioning over bony anatomy, um, you know, having uh, the yeah. to print some flexible material or, you know, something like color fabs, very uh, within a specific region only, um, you know, would definitely uh, help to reduce the, the overall thickness of the part as well, you know, trying to get that type of cushioning from adding layers like an onion of these different, you know, devices can get pretty bulky. So that's pretty cool. Um, you know, with the, so with this tight arrangement of nozzles here, the seven nozzles within the one end, hot end, um, do you see that you ever have any issues with like the, the actual plastic itself being so tight together? Um, you know, what, what, what are some like operating issues that, that might happen if the, um, if the nozzles were slightly clogged or they weren't, um, if you noticed for some reason they weren't extruding uh, at a similar rate, um, have you seen anything like that? That's um, something to consider with trying to print with different materials. Well, then we had to look into uh, even when printing with the same material in each nozzle. Yeah. Um, so helpful, helpful aspect in our technology is that we do not push the extrusion process to the limit. This is. What would happen if you go for larger nozzles or um, you would speed up the print head to go faster to, to get more productivity? Um, you'd also have to push the extrusion process to the limit. And this is uh, what causes problems and failures. Um, we don't have to do that. Um, we can operate the extrusion process in a safe uh, window of operation. And we do not see uh, problems uh, of clogging there. Um, given we do the right process planning for it, right? Um, if you don't, uh, of course, you can you can create all kinds of messes if you of messes if you uh, if you use the print apps uh, in the wrong way. Right. Um, but this is where uh, where a lot of our um, earlier development went into into controlling um, the extrusion process. Um, it's the crucial point. Um, we need to be able to start the extrusion precisely. And we also need to be able to adjust the extrusion rates um, precisely. And then we need to be uh, able to uh, stop extrusion precisely and make sure um, there's no material coming out of the nozzles that printed just a second before. All of these aspects, they um, needed uh, quite some, uh, quite some uh, deep dives into the, uh, the models that, that extrusion can be described by. And they are in, inside of the software and they take care that, uh, that each filament is, is treated the right way. Yeah, that's, that's definitely uh, a lot to consider when you're trying to think about the, uh, you know, design for additive manufacturing techniques as well, right? Maybe we would kind of consider, you know, designing a part specifically for, again, this certain type of FDM process. Um, with the one other thought that I would have, if you're extruding so much material at one time, uh, would be that you could potentially have a stronger part, right? Do you see kind of, have you, have you done any testing on that to see if you're, you know, only extruding, you know, one perimeter of a print at one time, and then it has to take that time to cool and come back around that, you know, when you're extruding all of this more material at once, do you see kind of a, you know, a better solidification between those perimeters and uh, and different layers? Um, yeah, um, we do see that. Um, some of the experience in single nozzle printing um, tells you that going larger in nozzle and slower in print head speed gives you an increase. Um, and the principle behind it, uh, it is very similar to, to what we experience in multi-nozzle printing. Um, to, to make layers stick together um, strongly, um, you have to make sure that the, the layer that was printed before, um, that it's heated up properly. Uh, it needs to reach temperature in order to be, to be active uh, enough to bond, to, to, um, to fuse uh, with the newly extruded material. Mm -hmm. And if you go with small nozzles, high printhead speed, uh, you don't have a lot of energy that's introduced into, into the previously printed layers. Um, so we don't need to go fast. Uh, we go with multiple nozzles. Uh, that's uh, one principle, and we find that um, 
just because of the fact that we use multiple nodes that extrude almost in the same place um, at the same time. We have a lot of energy that is introduced into the previously printed layers, and they have a much higher tendency to bond with, uh, to fuse with everything that is extruded uh, in that moment of time. Um, and it turns out that um, you can increase strength in the love direction. This it's known as the weak spot in, in, in layer-wise manufacturing. Right. Getting tears stick together. That's uh, that, that's a complicated part. If you go um, you do regular print, single nozzle prints, you might find yourself in having almost half, only half of the strength and stiffness in the build-up direction. And that uh, we think is an, um, it's, it's, a, it's a downside. It slows down printing in uh, the acceptance of printing in industry. Uh, because so many people, um, so many designers, they used to dealing with materials that are isotropic that have the same characteristics uh, in all the direction of, of, of space and printing does not deliver that. Um, we find that we can solve this problem to a very high degree. Um, in build-up direction, um, we tested um, PLA specimens. They came from uh, somewhere around 60% of strength uh, compared to what they are capable of in, in, inside of the printing layer. Um, and we added another 37% um, on that, just by the um, just by the aspect of extruding through multiple nozzles, mm -hmm. so all the other process parameters they stay the same, and just by extruding through multiple nozzles and introducing more heat in a uh, in, in a local area um, in a short period of time, um, we see that effect. Um, bonding between layers gets uh, gets a lot stronger. And um, at the same time, bonding inside of the layer, the strength inside of the layer um, is the same. Um, we don't have any downsides there. It's just that we we help solve the problems that come from that weak spot of printing. Um, yeah. It's um, it's something that uh, a lot of people actually like a lot. If you think about printing in, uh, in serial production or small series, um, you're always going to meet someone uh, who tells you uh, printing is not strong enough. Um, right. This have solved the problem. Um, printing has, has almost the same characteristics uh, if you do it with multiple nodes at the same time, uh, same characteristics in all directions of, 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 of space. Yeah, that's and, actually an interesting, you know, uh, feature of this kind of uh, extrusion, you know, method. You mentioned here you've got, you know, polypropylene as uh, one of the materials that you're using here. Um, so is uh, is polypro like the best application for this specific type of printing? What other materials do you see, you know, being utilized in this sense? Are there any restrictions that way? Um, we came to print uh, polypropylene um, by looking at the markets that would need uh, multi-nodal printing the most. And uh, we found that uh, polypropylene, it is used quite heavily um, in medtech. And Metec itself is a perfect fit with printing. Uh, so we have uh, shapes that need to correspond to body shapes, which are by nature all individual, and uh, they cannot follow one size fits all. Each part needs to be individual, so that's a great application for printing. And at the same time, we find a lot of parts that take forever in printing single nozzle. If you um, think about larger parts as, as autosis or, or processes, uh, in particular, um, um, leg processes, the sockets uh, that connect the pro processes to the, to the, sure. to the leg, um, these are printing jobs that um, take forever, two days or more, um, perfectly usual. Um, so if we cut down these process times um, by 75%, as wow. a relative as a relative orientation for for process time reduction uh, we give um, the customer um, a, a total saving absolute uh, saving of, of one and a half days um so it's um, we find that applications in meta um, they give us a lot of savings and absolute time and we find that these savings are particularly um, welcome there um, because oftentimes you find patients just waiting for the print. Uh, and um, so a print needs to be finished, uh, a part needs to be fit to the patient. And while printing, um, it's just waiting. I cannot move on. Uh, and 
Uh, so for um, for printing parts faster, um, it's particularly interesting to be in Metech. And Metech um, taught us that that PP is used a lot there. Sure. Uh, and that's that's how we started printing PP. Yeah. And it's a material that we uh, that we develop for for this on the machine. Mm -hmm. This is the material that our customers uh, use um, already, and we have a bunch of other materials lined up. Uh, that we want to go into. What we like is um, materials that are a little higher viscosity, um, helps us control the extrusion process. Hmm. Uh, we okay. find that even for uh, materials that come with reinforcement, um, if you have fibers uh, inside of the melt, um, it's gonna it's gonna behave um, higher higher viscosity um, and a higher viscosity. Um, so these are the materials that correspond quite well with the. Interesting. Yeah, I, I just started using some um, carbon fiber polypropylene from PP Print, which I know that you have a pretty strong relationship with them as well. Um, and I've been pretty impressed by that filament from the couple, you know, uh, prosthetic sockets and ankle foot orthoses that I've been printing. Um, you know, have you have you used that filament yet? I know it's been only out on the market just a short amount of time now. But we have tried it. We like it a lot. Yeah. So um, what you can expect us to demonstrate is a multi-material print uh, with this reinforced material um, on the inside of a part and virgin material on the outside. Uh, it's it's going to be a very good match um, because it's both properly, uh, polypropylene. Um, and we have the advantages of the virgin material on the outside uh, being all certified for skin contact and everything. And then you have strong material on the inside. Um, so that's um, something we're working we are uh, working on right now. Yeah, that, that's really neat. So, you know, like my, uh, I've got an AFO that I need to take off of the uh, the Raise Three D Pro Three Plus today, and uh, that's out of the Carbon Fiber Poly Pro. Uh, just that one material, though. Um, but to, yeah, to have just a uh, general polypropylene as an outer surface. Um, of that, maybe hopefully making it a little bit smoother surface finish as well. You know, the Carbon Fiber Poly Pro has a little bit of a matte surface finish to it slightly. So um, that's that's pretty neat to uh, to try to implement that in a way that would be a little bit more comfortable maybe for the patients. Um, yeah. So what other, you know, applications do you guys see for, you know, that kind of multi-material printing? Um, so Medtech is the first market we address, and we um, focus on to, to solve uh, that particular need. Um, we also have a very good perspective on jigs and fixtures, all, all kinds of, uh, of manufacturing aids um, that you use. You often find them used in a similar setup. Um, you cannot foretell what you're going to need at which point of time. Um, you know when you have a situation. Um, and from then on, you want to have Want to have your fix um, as soon as possible. So it's a time critical aspect uh, that we like, um, that, that we're good at. And um, for you to to give you a to give you an, an, an indication, I think I've mentioned it earlier. We're good at uh, at each part that has a structural function that needs to be strong. Um, it needs to have a certain amount of material in itself. So uh, you're you're looking at longer process times, and we can cut these. Um, and uh, then, as a rule of thumb, look at the um, look at the walls your single nozzle slicing gave you. If they consist of more than two walls, three or four walls, mm -hmm. um, you're gonna have, you're gonna have all the potential of of time savings. Um, then right. we like to go everywhere where where time is quick. The larger the part, um, the more savings we can get. And uh, manufacturing aids they are in a similar in, in, in a similar direction as, as Medtech. Um, you want to have them quick. Uh, you want to have them, uh, you, you cannot, cannot plan ahead. Um, so uh, yeah, this is a field that we're looking into now. Yeah, that's really neat. I'm sure there's a, a lot of different applications for this for, for big parts specifically, you know, being able to print them faster and uh, maybe a bit more uh, with a bit more detail as well. Um, can you give me some specs on the FX7 Pro? Um, you know, build volume interface. Uh, do you have a your own proprietary slicer included with that as well? 
Yeah. Um, so the printer is uh, it's a closed build state. Quite a huge build space. Um, it is half a meter of height and uh, 40 by 30 centimeters um, of build plate dimensions. Um, it is uh, build plate, obviously, it's heated. Um, we're working on heating inside of the build space as a feature. Um, it comes with the Epic 7 print head. Um, that's what you need uh, for it. And uh, we, um, are, um, we are compatible with all small filaments. Zero point seventy five millimeters by um, Yeah, and then um, there is a bunch of materials I mentioned earlier. A bunch of materials that we have lined up in development that we want to bring into the machine. Up until now, it's PP that is ready for application, and that's uh, this used now. Um, and then there's a bunch of materials uh, that are going to be introduced in, in the short future. Um, yeah, and um, also the multi nozzle aspect is going to be introduced. The printer itself, which comes uh, with the software, um, it is not very useful if you don't have a software that knows how to how to how to write the printer. Sure. Um, and uh, the software, it's a slicing software um, with the addition compared to a regular slicer that it knows how to uh, knows how to address um, different nozzles, um, how to address them in the right way. Um, so planning is uh, it's quite a lot more complicated than, than for single nozzles. Um, but the software that solves the problem, um, it comes with the printer. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure that, uh, again, that, that slicing process would have to be um, a bit more uh, a bit more involved to, you know, intricately place those exact nozzles where they need to be in the space. Um, because you, you had mentioned too that, you know, this, this print head doesn't swivel, right? It stays in one continuous orientation and then simply the print head is moving around the, the build volume. Um, yeah, so the whole, that whole paradigm of, of printing with multiple nozzles without rotating a printhead, um, all of that is inside the software. Um, we're not going to bother bother any uh, any of the users um, to, to to go into the details of it. Um, it's all inside of the, inside the slicing software. Sure, very nice. Yeah, it's uh, for the couple of pictures here again um, through the for the YouTube video feed. Uh, we've got a nice uh, inside look at the printer itself, the the whole hot end with um, you know the seven different extruders uh, coming out of it with the filament, and all in all in different colors: yellow, green, orange, blue, red. So you can kind of visualize where these um, a few perimeters are going. So that's pretty neat. I mean, I, I like the uh, the rainbow-esque feature of the how the print comes out in general, um, you know, adds maybe a different type of flair to, uh, you know, to something interesting like that. So you can kind of do that multi-color approach, you know, with the same material, I think is uh, a nice added, you know, a little bit of personalization to it too. That's the thing has to say here. Um, all, all the multiple colors that you see, this is for development purposes. Uh, we want to we want to see where each nozzle extrudes extrudes to to see if everything um, happens according to the plan. Um, and on the pictures you see, um, we are at an exhibition, uh, and we want to have an eye catcher. So uh, everybody who knows about printing knows that it's uh, a complicated task to have multiple colors in uh, in one print, uh, particularly in the way that we uh, that we demonstrated. Um, so um, it is. In multiple colors to to get attention, uh, but what we want customers uh, to use it if it's right. Going to be more uh, single color French all nozzles equipped with the same color of material, or uh, talked about multiple materials, but that's not going to be in different colors across the part. Yeah, right. That's really neat. So looking now at the couple of pictures that are on the screen, we see a. Uh, a prosthetic cover on our left here in a, in a skin tone, and then a prosthetic socket above the knee um, inside the printer just finished printing. Um, do you know the specific print times of those two uh, parts? And because I kind of have an inkling of how long I've been printing them in. Yeah. Um, 
system um, is over 20 hours. Um, Could you repeat that? Sorry. Um, the part on the right is, is a huge um, socket for a um, leg prosthesis um, above knee um, amputation. Um, so it's almost a kilogram of PP that is processed there. And the process uh, took us somewhere like 18, 19 hours with a 0 0.6 millimeter nozzle. Um, so that's, uh, it's, it's a great example for productivity because if you print that part, a uh, single nozzle, you're gonna be busy for days. And uh, we managed to cut process times to below a day, significantly below a day. Um, and um, yeah, Joe, what's your, what's your experience in, in printing um, sockets? Um, do you use a lot of PP? Yes, we do actually. So, um, you know, here in the U.S., uh, polypropylene is is looked at um, as somewhat of a kind of preparatory phase uh, material for its, um, you know, getting an amputee up and walking um, for a short period of time, short being maybe up to just one year. Um, you know, so we do print quite a, a few preparatory prosthetic sockets that way. Although, you know, they, they certainly are definitive in nature, you know, being able to withstand forces of, of over, you know, the use of one year. Uh, we've, we've thankfully shown that um, through some cyclic testing of over a million cycles for our solid ankle and articulated AFOs that have been printed in, in polypropylene. And that's a, a lot of where some of that application is too, actually, is in the orthotics um, side of things here. But yeah, for, for prosthetic sockets, I like the polypropylene because it's it's lighter weight. Um, you know, we have some pretty cool colors from PP print. Um, I'm about to do a print actually for an above the knee prosthetic socket um, that's going to be printed in PP prints blue uh, polypropylene color. And, you know, looking at, again, trying to optimize the, the print time. Um, so a similar socket like that size. Um, I would try to use a one millimeter nozzle to, to decrease that, you know, print time. But even, you know, you mentioned 18 hours on, on that socket, I probably still 24 to 36 to even 48 hours for sure. Um, you know, but yeah, we, we, we print with it quite a bit. Um, yeah, um, I'm happy to hear that, uh, PP is, is popular uh, over there and with, with your, with your, um, customers and partners. I mean, it's the same here. We find that the PP is used a lot on, and in the same phases of the tune name. It's at the beginning of, of, of care when fitting um, the processes. And also these um, um, these use cases, they are time critical ones. Um, if you want to transfer a patient from, from the end of, of, of the fitting process to a permanent care, you're not very time critical there. But in the beginning, uh, when it's about getting the patient up on the feet and walking again, um, that's, a, that's a time critical part. Um, and um, yeah, as you mentioned, if, if, you, if you don't have a boost in productivity, you need to go for larger nozzles. And uh, um, the process is, is, is going to be rougher in, in surface. And it's going to have going to have your challenges there. Yeah, this is uh, this is what we are, this is what we are doing. Right. Yeah, no, that'll, that'll be pretty neat to uh, to try to test out here. You know, can't wait to get one of these machines to the U.S. and really, yeah. you know, put it to the test. And, uh, you know, we've got this other prosthetic cover here on the other side that I see. Again, that print is easily um, anywhere from 18 to 24 hours for me, um, you know, using probably a 0.6 millimeter nozzle. So you can get a little bit more finer detail with that. Um, so I see, you know, this this uh, uh, skin color here, was that also polypropylene or is that TPU? Yeah, yeah polypro, okay. Um, yeah, we uh, tuned that part to be demonstrable on, during a day of the trade fair. Um, so it's, it takes eight hours, six hours, six and a half hours to be precise. Yeah, six nice. Hours to, to, to raise that up, um, yeah, it's, it's a good demonstration yeah for sure that's a third of the time that that we're running it right now even if i go up to one millimeter nozzle i think i've only been getting down to maybe nine hours print time for something like that yeah. of, of that height too you're not you're looking at easily 350 to 400 millimeters in in build height so 
that's pretty neat to see that you get that down to six hours. That's pretty impressive. Um, yeah, I know. Very cool. So we've got, you know, this, this one FX seven pro printer here, really nice, big build volume, you know, multi, multi nozzle printing. Um, you know, what, what is kind of this uh, next phase for Lictra? Where's, where's Lictra heading with, uh, you know, the development of this machine and, and commercialization? Um, I mentioned a few directions we're going to. Um, that is um, adding heating to the build space. Mm. Uh, that's going to happen uh, soon. Um, then introducing uh, multi-material prints, uh, which is basically a software feature for us. Um, so the hardware is capable of doing so already. Um, and it's just the software that needs to be tuned um, to to, to address every material channel in the appro appropriate way for the, for the material. Um, there's going to be more materials. Um, we talked about that already. Um, and then we're um, considering um, also offering uh, customized solutions. Um, there's a lot of uh, requests that would like to have the build space a little larger, um, sure. printing corsets um, and products. Um, that's uh, a use case where um, being fast is uh, crucial. Um, it's an enabler for printing uh, in itself um, because if, you, if you're you not fast enough, um, you're going to lose the, uh, the benefits of printing there. Um, and um, so the traditional way there is uh, going into detail uh, for this direction. Um, larger printers can help us uh, print corsets. And if you can print them, um, you can have the patient um, just scanned uh, when they're during surgery or before, um, and you can start printing right then. Um, okay. If you don't do printing, and uh, if you don't do printing fast enough, you cannot print. You need to have the part fast. Um, if you don't do this, um, you got to have to wait until the surgery is over and then have to trade for uh, a, a um, a part of around the patient's body in the conventional way. So larger build spaces, quick production of corsets. Um, this is a use case where printing needs to push into, and if it wants to push it, push there, um, it has to be fast. Um, so it's a very interesting application for us. We just need a slightly larger um, printer. That. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I I'm starting to think a lot more about printing big. Um, and getting into, you know, the different industries, uh, you know, within the the blanket of 3D printing and the additive manufacturing space, um, you know, I think that's that's kind of a, a growing trend, you know, to be wanting to print even bigger. Um, have you had any requests to, you know, print something as large as like partial car parts or, you know, anything else that's specifically for, you know, the polypropylene use cases at least so far. Um, yeah, there's a lot of requests, and um, I can, it makes sense to me because if you want to have large parts, uh, you're facing excessive process times. That's it corresponds the larger the part, um, the longer the process time. Um, yeah, um, there's a lot of requests for um, for large parts. Um, as long as they fit into our machines, now we can we can deliver on that. Um, for larger machines, uh, we'd have to talk about one of these customized solutions um, to get the technology running in a customized printer. Yeah. Sure. But it's, it's a very interesting field uh, to build large structures, I have to say. Yeah, no, and, and still with the, you know, level of detail that you're able to get with the 0 0.6 nozzle, right? You know, I think that's probably the one of the biggest, um, you know, benefits of, of this particular printing process, right? If you, if you look at demonstrations of large parts being printed, um, you always see that they use huge nozzles. Um, so this is uh, one way uh, to cope with the, with the process time. So the parts are always very rough. And uh, oftentimes, <clears throat> if you think about pellet printing, um, these large parts, they, uh, they only use wave mode um, to be more reliable. Um, so we can see that if large parts are being printed, they often come with a lot of limitations. 
connotation and detail and habitation and quality. Um, and and we, are, we are in a very good position to help here. Right. So you mentioned, you know, pellet printing a couple of times here. Do you think, you know, this, um, you know, nozzle system would work well for pellet printing too? Yeah. Um, yeah. We are um, developing a version of basal pellets. Um, it's a little uh, further away in time. Um, so that's a vision that we have to, um, to enable the nozzle printing with pellets uh, and one step uh, before would be to have a pellet printer, a single nozzle pellet printer. Um, it's going to be featured with a valve. Um, this is the uniqueness in the approach. We have a valve uh, that helps us cut extrusion precisely. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to get away from waste mode, um, which you see with a lot of uh, pellet printing examples. They stick to waste mode because they right. they. They have problems of cutting the extrusion precisely and also while traveling, not losing any material. That's a, that's a big problem. Right. Um, so yeah, we have a solution for that. Uh, we're going to introduce it in a single nozzle printer. And from there on, uh, it's going to be the development task to put it in a tight package, uh, tight design, and offer a multi-nozzle printer for it. Sure. Yeah, that, that'd be super interesting. Again, uh, I think that's definitely one thing that's missing from pellet printing right now is uh, being able to, you know, produce reliable parts with, um, you know, no stringing going through travel modes, uh, travel, travel moves rather, and, um, you know, not being constrained in your design to vase mode specifically. Um, you know, I think that opens up some, some pretty interesting doors for sure. Um I think it's a really interesting space that you guys are in with the, um, you know, this particular approach to printing, you know, more material at one time. Um, you know, yeah. Is there anything else about the printer that we didn't touch on that, uh, you know, you definitely want to um, share with the listeners here? Um, no, I think um, pretty much everything. Uh, that, um, it's a huge printer, easy to handle. Um, that's what we, uh, what we took care of. Um, the software connects to the printer automatically, so you send your um, your jobs uh, to the printer through, uh, through a, a network connection. Um, so we made sure that everything is integrated uh, um, pretty pretty uh, seamlessly. Uh, yeah, um, and it, it, it's made to function for users that are not experts in printing. Um, I told you about that. We do not want users to be experts in multi nozzle printing um, because this is pretty far away from, from the regular printing. So no, no need to be an expert in multi nozzle printing and there's not even a need to be an expert in printing. Um, software knows the machine, knows the material and handles, handles everything. Yeah, could you touch on a little bit more about the, the software specifically so that um... You're, it's it's mainly just a, a slicing software for for your part, right? Is there anything, you know, that's um, you I guess specific for the user input? Is there anything else that we have to consider from a design standpoint um, when we're slicing with multi nozzles? Um, so if you design a part that uh, does not consist of thick walls. Um, you're not going to be very successful using multiple nozzles for it, and so the software is not going to help you cut process time. Um, this is this is a limitation that you need to have into account. It's a, the principle. But if you want, if you print structural parts, you're going to find thick walls or thick enough walls in uh, in in every slice of your uh, of your planning. So from that point on, um, multi-nozzle um, planning is going to exploit the potential. And um, you don't have to you don't have to consider anything really. We ask you for a layer thickness that you want to have it needs to correspond with the with the nozzle diameter that is installed, um, and we give you a the the chance to to adjust it in, in, in a corridor of, of values um, that are compatible with the size of the nozzle. Um, you can do the same with print speeds, uh, tune them a little bit. Um, if, if, if you like to, to get your hands on the printing, um, but the software is going to make sure you don't adjust uh, something uh, into a region that is going to harm the printing. Sure. Um, okay. uh, 
um, for all those that are interested in, in getting their hands on, on the process, you have uh, these opportunities given by the software. Uh, but the software makes sure that uh, the combination of machine material um, that it's going to be uh, treated the right way. Um, yeah. And um, this is why we need to we need to take every material through a certification process. Uh, once we know how to how to process the material, we're going to feed the, the parameters into the software. And um, so the user, um, they don't have to uh, they don't have to um, deal with any more than seven parameters left to adjust. And even, even those, they are pre-adjusted in a way that uh, that you're going to get a nice print out of it. Um, but if you if you want to tune a little bit, you get the opportunity to do so. Right. So do you again thinking about like the amount of material you've got seven different nozzles going on? Um, you know, do you have to make sure that practically all of the spools that you're putting into the printer are all kind of at the same amount of material on each? So if like one spool were to run out mid print, um, you know, what's that situation like? Um, so we have a we have space for a larger spool um, that feeds the central nozzle of the array. Right. Um, that nozzle is in heavy duty, um, it extrudes most materials, so it comes with a large spool. And all the other spools, the six others uh, that this very printhead needs, um, they can be they can be at different different level. Um, so the process planning it knows the machine and it knows how much material is left in the machine. So if we find uh, one spool um, to be uh, to be um, to be equipped with less material. Uh, we can simply turn the model in, in the virtual printer in such a way so the, uh, that we put more load on the other nozzles okay. and we take load off uh, of that one spool that is not uh, filled enough to be to be pushing harder. Um, yeah, and um, so we we have a lot of opportunities to balance the load on. You just might be surprised that your part comes out. Uh, Slightly turned, but uh, you put it in virtual space. Yeah, that's interesting that you have you know that aspect of again this this design consideration with with the um, you know notion being you could print it in a different orientation to get uh, the most use out of all of that material in there and to and to kind of plan ahead. So if you knew the amounts on each spool that you could make sure that you finish the entire print simply by, you know, slicing it a few times, rotating that part around. Um, yeah, no, that's definitely uh, a nice feature to have. Uh, does it, does it still pause if you do, uh, you know, run out of material um, mistakenly? Um, actually, it's not, it's not gonna let you start the print if it knows that there's enough material that's available. Okay. Uh, starting the print, uh, before starting the print, uh, okay. she checks if there's enough material to, Go all the way. Yeah, you're going to be asked to to change a spool. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, you know, yeah, I, I like that aspect of it as well of making sure that you don't stop a print mid print anyways because that affects the structural integrity of it. Right? We talked earlier about the, um, you know, the heating of different layers. If you're pausing that print when it's supposed to be depositing material down, you know, you're you're going to have a slightly weaker bond. For the material right in that one spot, right? Just make sure you don't have that. Machine takes care of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, definitely a, a good thought, uh, forward thinking thought that, uh, you know, making, trying to make 3D printing more accessible to more people and, um, you know, getting rid of these slightly, um, you know, not really trivial variables. They're, they're definitely very, um, you know, intricate to the, uh, printing process of something structural. Um, but these, these, uh, variables that, you know, we shouldn't have to worry about any, anymore, right. You know, we're, we're getting so far along now within, um, the slicing, um, side of things that I think we're, we're learning more about, um, you know, how to set up that person for the most successful print that they can have simply by the features that you're putting into the slicer, right. And um, a lot of reduction in complexity comes from um, tuning a process to work with a machine and a given material. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, or putting it the other way, a lot of um, a lot of parameters uh, you see in a 
already with Slender, a single node of Slicer. So it's like 100, 500 to just to, to give a figure. You can access 500 parameters, and you don't you don't need to access them if you have three sets for the material and machine combination that you want to use. So right. all of this is covered by our Slicer, knowing very much about the machine, knowing very much about the material, um, and having all the experience uh, um, integrated uh, that we gained while uh, while testing and certifying everything. Um, so that helps us reduce complexity for the user a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, being able to um, have a have a printer of that caliber and making it as simple as 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 possible to uh, operate the machine and and have reliable results, I think, is very important. So, you know, well done in, in those thoughts. I think that uh, you know, again, I'm I'm excited to hopefully get my hands on an FX7 Pro here in the near future. Uh, when, uh, when you can make that jump, uh, you know, over to the U S here, um, you know, very excited to see this development go on. And, um, you know, is there anything else that you'd like our, our listeners to know about your, your development plans? I know you said that you're going to, uh, form next this year too, right? Yeah, true. Um, so everybody, uh, is very welcome to visit us at form next. Um, we're going to have a publication of, of the, the booth, uh, we're going to be in. Um, but make sure to stop by at, at the Lixa booth and uh, get your hands on the printer, see how it prints and see how fast it is. Uh, it's, it's really interesting. So this year we're going to have two machines there. Last year uh, we came with one. Uh, and we, uh, we're probably going to have one machine printing colors. Uh, so this is how you, how you can recognize us. But we also have uh, one machine that prints single color or at least a single color on the outside. Yeah, uh, that's uh, actually something that we were uh, that, that we were mistaken with. Uh, some people thought we we were we were aiming at printing rainbow color parts. Uh, so sure. so we're gonna have a second printer that does the the real application case. Yeah. Sure. No, I mean. It's, uh... Yeah, it's a it's a small thing to to overlook from a you know um, a a consumer standpoint here of of seeing what's printed but not quite uh, understanding the intention of why you know we wanted to show that particular feature off. Um, I can certainly see that from uh, you know being on the the exhibit hall floor. Uh, we should mention that that's Form Next in Germany. Um, they they just started Form Next Austin, uh, which just happened this past week. Um, you know, definitely uh, excited to get out to hopefully a couple of those additive manufacturing uh, conferences next year uh, myself. But, uh, you know, again, looking forward to your development here at Lictra, um, you know, and thanks for sharing everything with us today. Thank you very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Uh, very nice conversation, uh, I can say. And uh, Joe, you'll be the first uh, to know when we're ready to, to ship to the U.S., uh, hopefully sooner than later. Yeah, sounds great. Well, thank you again, Joshua, for coming on Fabrication Friday. And thank you to our listeners.